Hello, everybody, and welcome to this event on caretaker conventions in British government. I'm Meg Russell. I'm the director of the Constitution Unit, and I'm here to chair today's event. As everybody here knows, we've got a new prime minister who took over a month ago today on the 6th of September, following a lengthy Conservative Party leadership contest over the summer. Her predecessor, Boris Johnson, had been forced out two months earlier following mass ministerial resignations, which themselves followed a failed vote of no confidence in him by the Conservative Parliamentary Party. Johnson announced reluctantly that he would go, and there was initially speculation that he might be replaced by a new caretaker prime minister, such as Dominic Raab. Ultimately, this matter was resolved by the party and government agreeing that Johnson himself would stay on in a caretaker role while the leadership contest took place. But what does it mean to be a caretaker prime minister or a caretaker government? To what extent is it clear what the limitations on caretaker administrations are in terms of policy decisions and activity? Is it clear what should lead the caretaker conventions to apply in the first place? And is it clear whether and why they should have applied in the case of Boris Johnson? Did he, during those two months, in fact respect what the conventions were? And does all this stuff need to be more clearly spelt out for future occasions? On the 26th of September, former Constitution Unit Director Robert Hazel addressed some of these questions in a very interesting post on our blog, which I hope somebody might put in the chat if you haven't already. Um, but now we're here to explore them some more. And I'm delighted to be joined by a really stellar panel of people who know uh, a great deal about this subject, who will be able to explore some of these topics. We've got three speakers that you can see on the screen. Um, Lord O'Donnell, Gus O'Donnell, is a crossbench peer who served as cabinet secretary from 2005 to 2011. He oversaw the drafting of the UK's cabinet manual, which comes as close as you can currently get to explaining the caretaker conventions. He also presided over the handover from Gordon Brown's administration to the coalition government of David Cameron following the general election of 2010. Lord Barwell, Govin Barwell, is a Conservative peer and former minister uh, and MP who served as Theresa May's chief of staff in Downing Street from 2017 to 2019. He was in that role during a similar period following her announcement that she would step down as prime minister, which was followed by the leadership election that led to the premiership of Boris Johnson. He describes this period, incidentally, and in I think it's the last chapter of his book, which is highly recommended, his book called Chief of Staff. Professor Anne Tiernan is an adjunct professor at the Griffith Business School in Queensland, Australia. She's the co-author with Jennifer Menzies of Caretaker Conventions in Australasia, Minding the Shop for Government. So she'll be able to bring a refreshing, if also I think perhaps slightly disappointing, uh, depressing, I meant to say, uh, comparative perspective to our discussions. The panelists are gonna speak in that order uh, with Gus followed by Gavin, followed by Anne, taking just about five minutes each for their opening remarks. And then we'll have a discussion among the panel for perhaps around 20 minutes. After this, we'll turn to you, the audience, um, for your questions. If you've got a question you'd like to put to the panel, please use the Q&A panel uh, function that you can see at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat. Lisa James, who is here on the screen um, at the moment, is our Q&A facilitator, and she's going to go through the questions to select a range to put to the panel. By default, we'll ask the person who submitted each question to unmute themselves and ask it directly to the panel. But if you'd prefer to get Lisa to ask your question on your behalf, then please just say that when you submit it. And you can also ask questions anonymously. This whole, this whole session, including the Q&A session, is being recorded and will be, be posted online on the Constitution Unit website, YouTube channel, and will become a Constitution Unit podcast after the event. So you may want to bear in mind the fact that it's being recorded and will be freely available when deciding whether or not to ask your own question. So with no further ado, let me hand over to the first of our panelists to get us going, Gus O'Donnell. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks very much, Meg. And can I say, first of all, I think this is a really important topic and it's very timely. And the reason it's timely is I learned during the putting together the cabinet manual that you can do a lot by having rules that are in place before a crisis to help you manage during a crisis. I managed to get out one draft chapter of the cabinet manual before the 2010 election, but it was incredibly useful in sorting out um, the who should do what and um, 
and which which reflected on some of the issues we're talking about today. So that's really important. So I hope we can get on with it. The cabinet manual itself you mentioned is our attempt to bring together the rules, uh, the conventions, legislation, royal prerogatives, etc., as far as we could. And uh, it's worth remembering that its status is, uh, is, is not as great as I would like. Um, David Cameron, who kind of released it in the end, said, cabinets endorsed the manual as an authoritative guide for ministers and officials. And I expect everyone working in government to be mindful of the guidance it contains. So it's mindful. I would have liked him to say, to follow the guidance it contains, but mindful is what we've got, right? Um, in my preface to it, I said, and I think this is very relevant, um, that the, uh, we hope the cabinet manual will continue to play a useful role as a guide to the operations and procedures of governments. It will need to be updated periodically to reflect such developments. And I think that's one of the problems, that it hasn't been updated, and I would be strongly in favor of that. That's my, my second point. The question about caretaker, um, is quite an emotional one. When I was talking to Gordon Brown when he was prime minister about this, he really hated the word, right? For him, caretaker implied a government that doesn't have full authority. And so everything you'll see around that time, there is no, the word caretaker does not appear in the cabinet manual. And there's a reason for that, right? Um, so I think we do need to update it. Um, of course, the caretaker, let's come to the convention itself. It's a convention. Now, when I came to put together the cabinet manual, I asked some very, very clever people who understand law, and um, I should have asked you, Meg, as well, probably, um, what's a convention? And um, now there's a good question, and we could go on about that for a long time, but it's basically well, what we all agree to abide by until we stop abiding by it. And so that, to me, is a very gray area. And um, But at what we've got at the minute is as best we can. It's in chapter, in paragraph 229 of the uh, cabinet manual. And it says basically that uh, governments carry on. The essential business of government should be allowed, must be allowed to continue. But there are certain things uh, where activities should be deferred. Ministers continue in office and it is customary for them to observe discretion in initiating any action of a continuing or long-term character. And they go on to give examples about major policy decisions, procurement contracts, appointments, things like that. Uh, if decisions cannot wait, and we had examples of this, Alistair Darling um, going off to a Euro meeting during a Euro crisis, then uh, you should consult with the opposition. Now, in fact, during 2010, I have to say all the politicians behaved impeccably. Um, they all did what they should. Uh, and it was an example of what, I guess, Peter Hennessy would call good chaps doing what they should. And the problem about that, of course, is do we always have good chaps? And uh, I think that's one of the issues that we need to think about. So. Uh, when we look at what's happened more recently, um, I think people will want to learn, you know, did it work during the, the Johnson handover? Um, did it create precedents? Um, we got by, we, we survived, but were there any costs to that? So that suggestion, that period suggests to me that it would actually be much better if we could now come back to revise the manual, uh, work out what it should cover in the light of the experience we've had. Um, and are there any elements where we might want to legislate? Uh, I think it's very needed because uh, we might have a period where uh, there's a, a hung parliament next time, let's say, uh, who knows? And uh, it will be good to have this sorted out in advance. The period of government formation during 2010, I don't think should be regarded as a precedent. It was very quick. With hindsight, I kind of delighted about how quickly we got on with it. And uh, again, politicians behaving incredibly well and decisively. We can't assume that will happen next time. So is there a way we can get this sorted out in advance? Can we, as it were, depoliticize it? 
The only other, fi my final point in my five minutes, once you open this up uh, and we start thinking about a revised <laughs> cabinet manual, part of me says, mm, you know, I don't know where this might end up. And it could, you know, we all think about, well, it'll take steps forward and it'll all be a lot better, but it could easily take a lot of steps backward as well. So on that slightly depressing note, I will hand over to Gavin. Let me just, if I may, Gavin, before yeah. before we turn to you, just ask us a, a point of clarification, because obviously um, <clears throat> the 2010 handover was uh, was more than 12 years ago now. And in, in response to your question about why you didn't consult me, I could say, oh, well, of course, I was far too young at the time, uh, which which would be a lie. Um, <laughs> whilst we, we, we tend to have uh, very well informed audiences here at our Constitution Unit events, there may be one or two people in the audience who don't actually know exactly what happened in 2010. So could you just explain the, the period? You say it was quick. It was a handover from a single party government to a coalition government. Yeah. And you mentioned one thing that happened, but you didn't really say what it was. Could you just give us a factual roundup on those actual events? So do you mean the events leading up to the cabinet manual? No, no, uh, I, I just no, mean no, the, handover. the handover. I just mean how many days, mm -hmm, handover sure. from who to who, and what were the thorny issues that well, had was, to be considered was, in that period? Sure, it was like five days in May. It was one of the books that was written yeah. about it by one of the politicians. So it was very quick, sorry. Um, during that period, um, <clears throat> the result of the election had been one that we'd actually role played in advance. Um, with Conservatives' largest party, but no overall majority. Uh, and then there are a string of other parties, Lib Dems being the, uh, well, <clears throat> sorry, the Labour and then Lib Dems. And it was quite apparent that uh, the simplest coalition put together or grouping to come, put together was Conservative Lib Dem. You could have managed a Labour Lib Dem and a rainbow coalition. Uh, there were, that was much more complex. Gordon Brown tried to bring, pull that together. Uh, there were a number of members of the Labour Party who really didn't want that to happen. So in the end, uh, there was a Conservative Lib Dem coalition, full coalition put together. We went through the possibilities of uh, supply arrangements, all sorts of halfway houses. But in the end, they decided to do that. Again, it was because politicians used their flexibility, because when we role played it, um, the Lib Dems had asked for a vote on changing um, our first past the post system and the Conservatives had, as I think they'd said in advance of the uh, election, stuck, stuck by their position to say, no, we're not going to do it. And when we civil servants were role playing, of course, we were boring civil servants and didn't use any imagination, uh, whereas the politicians got on with it and came to a deal. So but you referred to Alistair Darling needing to do something as Chancellor in that period. Sure. That was one of the questions, wasn't it, about what the caretaker could do? Maybe just yes. tell us that little bit. And then so that little bit. Gavin. So um, we had uh, a Euro crisis going on with Greece and the like. Um, there was a, a, a meeting, key meeting of European finance, EU finance ministers um, during this period where some important decisions had to be made. And uh, Alistair Darling was, as ministers remain during this period, the chancellor. And uh, we talked about this as to how it should happen. And within the, the kind of guidance that we got, again, I have to stress, this was part of some drafts that were sitting in my office. They weren't, there wasn't a cabinet manual at that point. We talked through what I thought was the appropriate convention was that he should talk to uh, George Osborne and uh, and they did chat. They came to a conclusion about what they should do. Uh, and uh, Alistair Darling went off and abided by that. And it was, again, a, re a real example of political cooperation amongst grown-ups who um, got on with it and, and did the right thing. And I think everyone was happy about the, um, the solution. So these things can work, but it did depend on the two of them uh, being prepared to make it work. And you know the question is, Alistair Darling could have gone off and, and signed up to anything, really. He had the formal authority and power to do that. Nothing stops him in our rules and constitution, um, but he chose not to uh, okay. and to abide by the convention. That's really, really useful background. Sorry to delay you, no. Gavin. And, and Gavin may 
can now maybe tell us a little bit about a subsequent episode, but you might also have a few more <laughs> reflections of a political kind on the end of Johnson and, and what was going on there, perhaps. So, um, first of all, Meg, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. And it's, um, it's made me reflect a little bit on something that I probably didn't reflect enough on at the time when I was, when I was placed in the situation, but I'll come to that in a second. I think, I think my starting point, um, I very much agree with what Gus said, that this is a, a timely discussion. And I think it's timely for two reasons, both for the reason he gave, that you're much better thinking about these things when you're not in the moment. Um, but also, frankly, given where we are at the moment over the last couple of weeks, it's not entirely impossible that we end up in the situation again uh, in, in reasonably short order. So I think you're, for both reasons, your, your timing is impeccable as always, mate. Um, I also think Gus is bang on the money in saying this is in the moment, this is a very emotional issue. Because by definition, you are dealing with one of two potential situations. You're either dealing as he had to deal with a prime minister who has just lost an election, um, but where it's not clear, um, they might still just about be able to cling on in a minority or in a coalition. And it's certainly not clear who among their opponents might take over, but they're, they're bruised, they've just taken a a blow to their egos electorally, or you're dealing with the situation that I had to deal with where a prime minister has either come to the conclusion that they've lost the support of their party and voluntarily stood down as Theresa did, or has kind of been forced out. Um, I mean, obviously in Boris's case, it didn't actually come to losing a vote of confidence, but it, it was clear that that was what was going to happen had he not. Uh, ultimately recognised the reality and we had this kind of spectacle of an incredible number of ministers um, resigning in, in very short order. So the, the principle that you're dealing with has had a bad time at the moment that this situation um, uh, arises. I, I think there are then some interesting questions and I think they do vary from these two scenarios about, the, about constitutional authority what the government constitutionally can do and kind of political authority, which is a slightly different thing. So Gus's example of the position that Alastair found himself in is a really good one. He constitutionally, he was absolutely entitled as the serving chancellor of the Exchequer to take the decisions that he needed to make at that conference that he'd gone to. Um, political authority, I think is a little bit different. And I think it genuinely will vary from case to case. So let's take the three examples I talked about. Uh, in Gordon's case, it was pretty clear Labour had basically lost the election. You know, they'd been the party government, they'd seen a significant decrease in their vote share. So his kind of political standing was significantly diminished, both in terms of his own party, and, and it, uh, the dust drew out nicely there the point that actually some of his own party didn't want him to try and carry on in power, essentially, but also his standing with the media, with the, with the electorate as a whole. Um, then uh, in Theresa's case, you know, I think her political authority was at an end on Brexit. Had she tried to do anything more on Brexit, that would have been incredibly controversial within the party. But it, it was, you know, we were not going to have an election, at least, at least imminently. The Conservative Party was going to continue in government. And actually, there wasn't a lot of controversy about domestic policy. So she still had a reasonable degree of manoeuvre to carry on and do a few things. I mean, actually, you could argue the biggest thing Theresa May did in her entire premiership, which was the commitment to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, happened in this period after she had announced that she was going to be, that she had stood down as leader of the Conservative Party and therefore set an end date on her, on her time as Prime Minister. And I think Boris was kind of in between the two, um, in that the problems that he had got into were not about a specific policy issue, they were about the way in which he had been running the government. And therefore, I think you could say his wider political authority had been eroded to do new things. Um, so I think those that sort of, this is what's difficult, I think, to, to either legislate for or to write a convention that covers what can be quite a subtly different range of situations that the cabinet secretary uh, might be dealing with at any point in time. Um, when Gus was running through the wording, he used two different phrases and they, they caught my attention because they're slightly different. So the first word he used was discretion about access, uh, 
exercising discretion. And the other phrase he used was about whether there was anything that couldn't wait. Right? And that is a, a, a much lower test, right? So I would say to you, Theresa May definitely took decisions in those last two months of her premiership that could have waited for the next government. Um, but I do think that she exercised discretion. Um, she, both, she didn't try and do anything more on Brexit. She recognised that was the issue where she kind of lost the confidence of her party and, and couldn't do anything more on that. And that was clearly for the next government. And then on the rest of it, she picked the things where actually she felt either of her potential successors would not have a problem with what she was doing. Um, and I was often sent to consult people to check that that was the case essentially. Now, there was still a little bit of tension because occasionally one or other of the leadership camps would say, well, I don't have a problem with what she's proposing to do, but I'd quite like that announcement to be saved for me because it's a nice thing to announce. Um, so there was still a little bit of tension there, but, but in her mind, because there wasn't gonna be an election, because there was gonna be a transition within party, she couldn't touch Brexit and she couldn't do anything that one of her successors adamantly opposed and would, would immediately reverse essentially. But if it was something that actually the broad mass of the Conservative Party agreed on, then she felt um, that the test of discretion allowed her uh, to, do, to, to progress it. And then the final comment I had um, was, on, was on what I would see as the sort of dilemmas on either side here. Um, so again, Gus sort of said that like, these things are sort of written on the assessment that people behave reasonably. Um, and that we, you know, that we expect the best of our politicians and that they behave as they should in these situations. And so there's obviously a risk that you get a bad actor um, who, doesn't, who doesn't conform to those standards. But I think there is a risk on the other side. And actually, I think if you look at uh, Boris Johnson and how he behaved, he did basically, I think, recognise the constraints on what he could do. And if anything, the kind of criticism in the media and among, to a degree, among the public was the country's in, you know, we're in a very difficult economic situation here and we need to get on with decisions and we've got a government that is refusing to do it. Now, you can look at this, I think, either way. Um, personally, I would say the Conservative Party put him in a very difficult position by having such an elongated leadership contest. If, if I had been sitting on the 1922 committee, I would have said, we can't afford to allow this to go all the way through to September. That's not a tenable position. We need in some way to um, make sure this process runs much more rapidly, get an earlier announcement that, um, uh, you know, a, 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 that minimizes the length of period of this caretaker government or whatever phrase you want to describe it. Um, but I think he was also in a difficult position because the fundamental thing that the media were pushing him on, which was what to do on cost of living crisis, was the fundamental issue of debate between the two leadership candidates. And so to be fair to him, and I'm, those people watching this will know I'm not necessarily a leading member of his fan club, but to give him, to be fair to him in this situation, if he had taken any decisions on that issue, he would have been taking sides in what was the active debate in the leadership contest, and he could not have had confidence that um, what he was doing wouldn't be wouldn't be unpicked by whichever candidate then subsequently won that um, election. So, if you like, I think there are dangers on both sides. There's a, there's a zombie government danger in a moment of crisis, and there isn't a constitutional problem because, as Gus says, if if you could have argued that he had to take a decision, he would have been constitutionally entitled to do it but he felt politically constrained. And then on the other side of the fence, you've got this kind of bad actor risk, essentially, um, that you're also uh, trying to guide against. So I'm not sure if I've come up with any definitive conclusions there, but hopefully the historical experience um, is useful. The last thing I'll say, um, which is just a personal reflection rather than what I think should happen. Um, but I think there's one of your questions I can answer definitively, which is, you know, do we need to think about this question and define better what our expectations are? Yes because I wasn't really even aware in the situation that there were conventions. I certainly felt bound by, you know, I understood there were political limitations on what Theresa could do in that situation, but I didn't particularly think about historical precedents or anything. And I mean, I hope that the civil servants that worked with me during the time I was chief of staff would feel that I tried to work very collaboratively with them. 
But I was conscious that from the moment that she announced she was standing down as leader of the Conservative Party, our interests diverged a little. Um, because I then felt, you know, I was feeling pretty sore myself. And I wanted those last two months, I wanted her to be able to achieve the maximum she could in that time available. So I, you know, from that point onwards, I felt I was very much team Theresa May and I'm batting to get the maximum outcome for her. And Peter Hill, who was the principal private secretary and, and Mark Sobel was the cabinet secretary at the time, they had to be thinking about preparations for the next government and the discussions they were having with. So, so having been a very tight team that I feel worked very well together, it's important to record that at that point, the kind of political team and the civil service team had slightly different objectives in what, and we never fell out, but there, it's important to acknowledge that reality, I think, that you find yourself in as chief of staff in that moment. That is wonderful. That's really, really rich and interesting. And there's lots of questions I want to ask you, but uh, let's let's move straight to Anne. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that come out of Robert's blog that immediately point up differences between your side of the world and ours. One is that you don't actually have these protracted leadership contests, which seem to have been the cause of some of the controversies in, in, in these two most recent cases that we're talking about. But secondly, you've got an awful lot written down, much more than we do. Um, and we'd be tempted to think, well, writing things down might be the answer, but you might tell us it isn't. How, what, what, what perspectives can you bring? Yeah, thanks, Meg. And look, thanks for the invitation to be part of this distinguished panel. Um, I just want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I'm coming to you from here in Brisbane. Mianjin is the Indigenous name and pay respects to elders past, present and to extend that respect to all First Peoples. Um, Robert's um, blog was a tremendous foregrounding for this discussion. And actually, he's got a great chapter in a book. that We've also got a, a, a chapter in um, comparing the conventions across the different systems. And, and yeah, quite clearly, Australia's are uh, much more codified. They're updated regularly and they are a feature of our Cabinet Handbook, which has you know, been publicly available and, and documented for a long time. Um, you know, one implication of that is that the onus for observing and respecting the caretaker conventions has in sort of a strange way shifted from politicians to officials um, who see those guidance documents as this quite important bulwark in, in pushing back against ministers and their staff who are many much more numerous and powerful within the Australian executive um, during the heat of an election campaign. Um, and of course, we have long faux campaigns uh, that precede elections. So you've got five year terms, the Australian Commonwealth still has three year terms, and they almost never go full term. Um, and a, the Prime Minister decides. Um, so I was really struck while uh, you were talking that, you know, it was only in 2015 that the former BBC correspondent, um, Nick Bryant, who's just moved back to Australia, described us as the coup capital of the democratic world. And we'd had five prime ministers in five years. But, you know, as you pointed out, Meg, despite the revolving door of of PMs, um, the caretaker conventions didn't apply because the party's processes for changing leaders are so different. And, and you know, here, the parliamentary party, not, you know, however few uh, members of the political party um, determine the outcome of a leadership context. So Kevin Rudd gets replaced by Julia Gillard and Gillard by Rudd a few reads out from the 2013 poll when they lose support. The same is true for Tony Abbott and then Malcolm Turnbull. Um, and it's all done and dusted quite quickly and brutally and the business of government continues. And then the deposed leader doesn't get to do um, anything in the, that period. They get to be humiliated and retire to the backbench where they can become a miserable ghost uh, as, as the, our prime ministers tend to. So we've only ever had two cases of a caretaker prime minister being appointed. And the first for people who might remember was when um, Harold Holt disappeared while swimming off Cheviot Beach in Victoria in 1967. Um, and this is really interesting to me in terms of the difference between um, Britain and Australia. Then the country party leader and the deputy PM was appointed caretaker prime minister until the Liberal Party could um, could elect a new leader. And, you know, so, you know, we got quite a bit of Boris and I follow um, your work, the Constitution Unit's work closely, but it's not clear to me why the deputy leader couldn't have become the caretaker until, you know, even in that elongated process. So um, the second case we had, of course, was when the, uh, the Governor General, Sir John Kerr, dismissed the Labor Prime Minister um, and he appointed a caretaker Prime Minister pending a federal election. So our guidance doc documents are really clear, they're proliferated, as I've said, but it's really covering the election period. Um, 
you know, to, to Gus's point about the potential for, for long periods post-election, um, uh, we had a hung parliament in 2010. It actually took two weeks uh, to form a government. In New Zealand, it can routinely take a lot longer than that. Um, and so the rules have evolved, the, the conventions and the understandings have, have uh, evolved to accommodate that. And I think increasingly we've seen the decline of support for the major parties and the rise of independence. And, you know, that's likely to be more of a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the, the, the presence and the awareness of the conventions, because they um, have been codified and available for a long time, um, means that, you know, people are familiar with them and they have that, that flexibility. And this is the trade-off, isn't it? Codification versus flexibility. Uh, how do we think about that? And it, and it was the case that, you know, an experienced public service uh, remains so important in being able to bring those uh, issues to um, politicians' attention, but also, you know, as Gus has pointed out, the you know the good chaps uh, who are prepared to act like grown-ups in a very fraught environment that Gavin's um, characterised so well. Um, the principles here are very similar to what Robert outlined in his post, um, avoiding major decisions, contracts and significant appointments, and just generally not binding an incoming government. Um, and a an issue that's become very significant here is avoiding miring the public service in political controversy, inhibiting its capacity to serve current and future governments. And in many ways, codification has become this defensive posture to hyperpartisan politics. Um, and, you know, public servants have found themselves in very awkward uh, situations having to account for what happens, um, you know, after an election for decisions. There's been a lot about um, lawful directions, public servants following lawful directions from ministers who might have a higher risk threshold uh, than officials during this fraught time. We had a very egregious case in the um, 2022 federal election um, of that that's kind of playing out now for officials in rather unpleasant ways. Um, it's very interesting that officials enjoy much stronger protection actually in the UK than exists here. Um, you know, and I think that was a feature, Gus, of the um, of the 2011 cabinet manual work. So the um, the involvement, I think, of your parliament and um, of and the notification of the Auditor General and other houses of parliament is something that the Australian officials, I think, can only dream of. <laughs> and the idea that the, the parliament might have a role to play in the scrutinising the cabinet manual is, you know, I just don't think. Uh, would be on the cards here, although perhaps this new uh, federal parliament that we've now got much more diverse um, you know, might allow for that. Codification has not um, afraid, deterred people from stretching and, you know, flagrantly breaching the conventions. And this was the depressing thing that, um, uh, that Meg alluded to earlier. Significant appointments are the thing that has, so, you know, it's been lots of other things at different times, but significant appointments is the thing that is becoming a big issue here um, in recent elections. So the Morrison government brought forward many appointments to tribunals, uh, you know, that weren't even falling due and really tried to bind uh, an incoming government for a long time, um, which is very unreasonable, I think. And um, and I've just that just that sense of exercising restraint has been diminished quite a bit. And and I think um, in, in thinking about tonight, uh, tonight my time, um, I think that kind of highlights a convention that we should ha perhaps talk more about. That one of collective responsibility. So you know, predominant prime ministers run around doing what what they're doing. Sometimes they get replaced, but actually, you know, quite a bit of the overreach could be, uh, I think, moderated by some cabinet colleagues having a stronger uh, position about this and about the long term consequences. Um, we know that the sanctions for breaching conventions are moral and political, um, but in the end, the final arbiter is of the standards is the prime minister, and I'm not sure there's a way around that. And, and we've seen some amazingly nihilistic behaviour from governments facing electoral defeat. Um, the 2019 federal election was pretty diabolical. And what's interesting is how even if they cling to power, that legacy can haunt them through the subsequent term and then lead to, you know, what we saw here in 2022. So I can think of lots of examples of that. And I, I wish that we could have the conversation with politicians about, you know, what seems like a short-term expedient decision in the heat of a campaign can actually dog you for a really long time and and in fact you know integrity and accountability and trust were decisive themes in our election um most recent election the, the push for codification can have unintended consequences i think and the one that we point to in our research is really um, the extent to which the officials are really stepping in 
um, does risk undermining that mutuality and reciprocity that political actors feel. Um, I've got my eye on the time, Meg, so I'll kind of stop there. Um, but, you know, there is a real job to do. I was really interested, Gavin, that, you know, you didn't feel that it was so explicit for you. There really is a job to, um, to educate people. And I think, too, particularly the media who really don't understand the caretaker conventions at all. And I, I know Gordon Brown, you know, faced that experience, you know, being criticised for when he should resign and so on and so on. They really don't understand it very well. So it's important to have a debate about it so that we can lift the level of public awareness. That's really interesting. Thank you, Anne. Um, I've also got my eye on the time and um, I do want to make sure that we get to the audience questions in good time. I can see that there's a few in the in the in the Q&A box. I would encourage more people to submit their questions now. And in the meantime, I'll try and entertain the panel with maybe a couple of kind of broad areas. That I would love to dig in more on one of which you've you've sort of invited me to do there, Anne, which is the effects of codification. I mean, Gus, you 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 say that things should change and that we should review what's written in the in the cabinet manual it would be interesting to know what you think what proposals you would make as to what should be written and how much should be written i mean it, it seems to me there are there are there are at least a couple of areas here one is when should the convention apply in what circumstances should we spell that out more and I, I was very, I was triggered by Anne mentioning Howard Holt, which Harold Holt, which of course is a fascinating case to think about Harold Wilson in relation to what Gavin said that there's always a degree of emotionality around this. You said, and undoubtedly, I mean, I have to sort of be a bit inventive with Harold Wilson. I mean, we all know after the fact that Harold Wilson resigned because he was ill. And clearly in those days, there was a very fast turnover. There was no member ballot. James Callaghan took over all very smooth. If that were happening now, if the prime minister were ill and said, I'm going to step down because I'm unwell and I need a successor, I don't think there would be any suggestion that there was no confidence in Harold Wilson or somebody in that situation. It's emotional, but I don't actually see why in that situation you would have to be a caretaker, whereas the May situation is a bit different. And as you said, Gavin, the Johnson situation is a bit different to that. So writing that down is one challenge, Gus. And then there's what the what the actual rule should be. Do you do you have specific proposals? And then I'd like to bring Anne in and say, do you see, and I guess Gus as well, do you see a problem for officials actually policing these boundaries? Do, do we begin to get into unintended consequences, as Anne said? Well, I mean, I, I would argue very much that the reason for the change is a lot of the stuff around um, the, the so-called caretaker convention is all written about change of government, um, for um, hung parliaments. It's not about the thing that, that Gavin was talking about. And that, you know, I've been through, you know, John Major, Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown. I mean, you know, the change of prime minister within the same party. And I think that's that's an area that it could com confront well. And I think a part of that, as, as Gavin was kind of hinting at, which I would dearly like to happen, was for both parties to think about the procedures they have for electing a new leader i think god please you know can we can we sort that one out um i think that would be really important and then in terms of the the conventions itself <clears throat> it would be good just to have a few principles in there about you know what constitutes the right sorts of issues that that go there i mean everything in the in the cabinet manual was was very much fought over and and you know, it's it's politicians want to maintain as much discretion as possible. Is is the honest answer, and sometimes that makes a lot of sense. But it's it's a question of can there be guardrails? You know, can you say, look, you know, within this, this is the area of your discretion, which is the point that, that, that's in there at the moment. But here are here are things which aren't, and uh, and we we've, we've tried to spell out some of them, but I I'm not sure. I think a, a good debate about what those things should be and, and, and actually that bit about appointments I think is is very important you know the you just need to look at the US and see stuffing the Supreme Court you know it, it can be absolutely massive uh, those those sorts of appointments and it can be very difficult for a for a civil service trying to maintain the impartiality um, when you have a view and the trouble with this is you know if a, if a new lot people start changing these things, start changing civil servants, then once you've done it, you go down the Australian route very quickly because 
the new politicians come in and can rightly say, well, hang on, you, you weren't appointed in an impartial way. You were appointed by the last lot because you agreed with them. Well, that's what they might say. And therefore, off you go. I'm getting someone in that agrees with me. And the, <clears throat> the whole thing cascades out of control. So I think, to me, that's a really important thing to try and keep hold of, that essence of keeping appointments away from all of this. That's very, very interesting, isn't it? I mean, the cabinet manual seems like a quite sort of technocratic document. That's the sort of thing that, you know, senior civil servants discuss with academics and so on. But actually, these are very, very political questions, aren't they? If you're going to get agreement on what kind of appointments are appropriate, then you have to get buy in from the parties that are likely to be in government that they agree those principles on a sort of bilateral basis. I mean, I should just add one thing on, on the cabinet manual, for example as to how contentious these things were. I mean, there was, we put in a bit about war powers uh, because William Hague had actually said something in parliament, which we all took as the way it would be that, that parliament will be consulted in the event of us going to war. And, um, it, you know, there, there will be a, a good debate. In the end, that didn't get through um, for various reasons, it's not in there. Um, you know, so, so there are some big issues which, uh, in the end, the way you solve them was by saying nothing. Uh, so there's a lot behind the scenes that's, that's buried away that's just not there. Mm. One thing you've all been, I mean, G Gavin did make reference to this uh, in, and in a rather sort of positive, generous way, I, I think, um, is whether Johnson did actually follow the conventions over the summer. <laughs> Um, Gavin, you were talking about the, the energy crisis and how it was unfair to accuse him of being a zombie government because, you know, it had been agreed that he would be a caretaker. Um, but Robert draws attention actually again on appointments to some examples in his blog. Um, Simone Finn being appointed to the Committee on Standards in Public Life, Harry Mount being appointed to the House of Lords Appointments Commission, these were both allies of Johnson, so he might have raised eyebrows even in a non-caretaker situation, but he went ahead and made those appointments. So do we think that he was actually following the rules? And I suppose maybe I could push you a bit further. You, I mean, you weren't in the room, um, I, I'm sure, but you may well know through your networks as to what really the expectation was, because you, you got the sense that it was a deal inside the Conservative Party, that he was there on sufferance, on the basis that he had basically pledged not to do certain things. I mean, you know, what did he sign up to and did he follow through, do you think? And you're on mute. I don't think the deal was, was ever detailed and explicit. I mean, it is definitely the case that after he, we, there was a very, if you remember, there was, a, there was a period of about sort of 18 hours where the government got itself into the kind of comical alley position of not really acknowledging the reality of what was going on in the outside world around it in terms of ministerial resignations. And people got quite angry then and people began to talk about how he's behaving Trump-like. And to be fair, it, it just took him a little bit, as, it, as is often gonna be the case for prime ministers, it took him a little bit longer to catch up with where the world really was than everybody else who was watching it but wasn't personally emotionally invested in it. And so initially, I think there was a feeling among some of the people who had been pushing quite hard to get him out that he shouldn't be allowed to stay because they were worried about how he was going to pay. Now, I think the points Robert makes in his blog are entirely fair. You could probably pick on a few individual decisions that were made and say, should he really have been doing that? But I think you would be hard pressed to argue over that period that he kind of consistently overstepped the mark on the policy front. And that's what the Conservative Party didn't want him to do, essentially. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There are, there's the odd decision, most of which, if I was being, I've been generous so far, but if I was being unfair, the things you've mentioned are often about his ability to either protect himself against um, future issues going down the line or reward some of his supporters, whatever. So they're kind of thinking about the future after being prime minister rather than the kind of policy issues. But I think if you asked most of the country, their frustration would have been the opposite, that we went through this period of kind of zombie government when they were desperate for things to be got on with and we weren't able to do that. And that's my point really about the concerns people have here are on both sides of the equation. I mean, coming back to your question to Gus, just very quickly, my, my view would be 
that the, there are three types of situations that I would see it. There's what the original thing was written for, which is hung parliament. There is a prime minister goes because they have lost the confidence of their party, either because the party has formally said so, or the prime minister has sort of jumped just before they were about to get a shove. And I think that's not the same as the hung parliament scenario, but some of the same issues arise there. Then I think there's the scenario where the prime minister is ill or just retires at the end of their, you know, they decide they've had a long enough stint and it's time for someone else to go. And then I don't think any of the issues really arise at that point. Uh, is that, I mean, if you, if you think about something recent in UK history, we had a short period where Dom Raab essentially acted as prime minister while Boris Johnson was sufficiently unwell and in hospital and unable to perform the duties. And everybody I speak to in the civil service, some of whom wouldn't be always fans about the way Dom behaved towards officials, but during that period, I think he got quite a lot of credit for the way he handled that particular mm -hmm. situation with maturity. And I don't think anyone would say the conventions applied in that situation. It, you know, the, the government clearly still enjoyed confidence of the House and the confidence of the vast majority of Conservative MPs. And he was kind of acting as a stand-in for what everyone hoped would be a short period while the Prime Minister's unwell. So I would kind of, I would kind of, I think you need to codify those three kind of different types of situation. You'll, I'd be, I'd be wary of doing it in too much detail because you'll never quite cater for every eventuality. And as I, as I said in my remarks, I see a difference between Theresa, where the problem was about one, albeit very important policy, and Boris, where he'd lost confidence because of general personal behaviour, not policy issues, essentially. And there, there is a very peculiar conundrum, isn't there, which is set out in Robert's blog, that, um, I mean, Johnson actually won a vote of confidence yeah. after these events. So if you're trying to do something that's codified and give civil servants something to say, are we on A, B or C here, then there was no sign that he'd lost the confidence. But as you no. say, actually, we kind of all knew that he had. Yeah. So how do you police that uh, as an official? That's quite difficult. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the number of ministerial resignations gave you a clue as to roughly what. <laughs> and do, I, is I there anything? That, 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 I would add that um, the Tony Blair Gordon Brown thing is another example, which is kind of slightly different variant. But but one point on the uh, the Johnson one, my understanding, but it was only because they briefed out afterwards that there were cabinet discussions and cabinet agreements about what would and wouldn't happen which would be interesting to know precisely what they were. I mean, there was, I think all we've got at the moment is what they decided to brief as opposed to what they actually decided. So one day the cabinet minutes might tell us. We're in danger of crowding out the audience. I'm gonna invite Lisa on the screen, but in the meantime, Anne, have you got any reflections on what's been said here in terms of you know the risks of going down certain paths that we're discussing? Well, I mean, I am a bit confounded why the parties don't want to reform their leadership processes, because then that negates the situation, you know, that Gavin's described as kind of the second scenario. So that that's kind of interesting. Well, William um, Hague, who uh, introduced the Conservative membership ballot, uh, actually was in the newspapers a couple of days ago saying he does want to reform it back to what it used to be, which is choice by MPs. So we've maybe begun that discussion. <laughs> yes, indeed. And of course, then they kind of moderated those rules in Australia after the revolving door too, and that, that created some problems. I was only thinking that um you know somebody becoming ill is a lot more convent and somebody stepping in is a lot more conventional than the prime minister secretly swearing themselves into five portfolios as is currently being investigated about scott morrison here so there's a lot of unusual things going on in australia in the last period of time yeah and the, well, some of the merits obviously of a political flexible constitution is that you don't have to set down you know clause 1.11.17.2 um, you deal with each situation as it arises um, in the mm. most sensible, mature manner. But, um, but Lisa, there is a lot of know. learning, I think, you know, facilitated by a federal arrangement. And I guess that's, you know, that also is something that, that um, Robert points to in his piece. Lisa, would you like to uh, tell us what questioners you have or what questions you have for the rest of the discussion? Yes, thank you to everyone who sent in questions. We're going to try to get to as many as possible in the time we have left. Um, first, I'm going to call on Jack Newman um, to ask about the danger of rogue actors. Uh, Richard Johnson with a challenge on how we should think about uh, the end of the Johnson government. And then I will pose an anonymous question at the end. Okay. Uh, so the first was 
Jack. Can you unmute Jack? I think we have to actually intervene to allow Jack to unmute. Or indeed, Richard, we don't have to take them in that order. There we have Jack. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, Hi. thank you. Um, really interesting discussion. So my question was basically this distinction that's just been drawn between kind of death illness sit situation, the deposed by party situation and the hung parliament situation as to which is the most dangerous if there were to be a bad actor. And I suppose mm. a slightly cheeky question as well is, does the Liz Truss's current situation bear any similarities to the caretaker situation? Thank you. <laughs> no, make it contemporary. That's good. Uh, um, OK, do we have Richard? Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So I wanted to challenge whether or not the Johnson government was a caretaker government, because I think that a caretaker government refers to when there's a prime minister who either lacks a commons majority or there is no parliament at all because it's been dissolved and that prime minister should act with restraint. Whereas Johnson clearly did command confidence of the House of Commons because the Labour Party put down a confidence vote in the 18th of July and he won it. Um, so would it be more accurate to describe Johnson as a lame duck prime minister rather than as a caretaker prime minister? Thank you. And then Lisa, do you want to throw the third question in with this batch and then we'll pass around the panel? Yep. So the third question um, asks, can the panel comment on the current medium term caretaker arrangements of the Northern Ireland Assembly, um, particularly the impact of local government running without support or challenge from the legislature uh, and the impact on citizens? Wow. OK, that's a different dimension. Um, Anne, would you like to come in first and cherry pick? And then um, we'll leave uh, the, the tricky bits uh, for the Brits. <laughs> uh, yeah, stick to that Northern Ireland question, heavens. Um, so the bad actors are the most dangerous um, at the end, I think, of a government when they really know that they're going to lose. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, we saw the extreme example of that in the US where they don't accept uh, where they're going to lose. And I know it's an extreme example, but, um, but certainly, you know, I alluded to some of the nasty things that can happen and when the sanctions that are moral and political for some people they just don't care uh, and it's the damage the institution wrought that I think many of us would be concerned about um, in that scenario so that's what I'd always be concerned about. You want to attempt anything else? No, oh, you've muted. Okay, uh, I will pass to Gavin. Um, maybe it's the closest challenge to you in terms of whether Johnson was a caretaker, but Gus may have thoughts on that as well. And, and if either of you want to comment on Northern Ireland, you've both got um, some good experience up there. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I think I was saying that I, I would distinguish between the sort of Johnson May situation and the sort of hung parliament situation. So if you want to use a different terminology to describe that, I'm fine with that. I mean, it's technically true, as the question has said, that he won a vote of confidence, but if he hadn't stood down as party leader, I'm not so sure he would have done. Um, so you, you, there is a reality there that the person's political authority is not what it was before in the way that there isn't, if someone's just retiring or ill health or whatever, essentially. Um, then I think on Northern Ireland, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but I would observe that often we need arrangements in Northern Ireland, which you wouldn't consider desirable everywhere else to reflect the complexity and difficulties that we experience. And, you know, for most of, for all of the period that I was chief of staff in number 10, Northern Ireland had no functioning government. Um, and it was clear that even if we managed to restore it, there was the risk that this would happen again, which is indeed what has happened and that you needed some way of trying to keep some of the public services in Northern Ireland functioning in the event that the devolved institutions collapsed again. So uh, I don't necessarily, I don't disagree with what's going on there. I would consider it non-ideal and not applicable to other parts of the country, but probably necessary in the unique circumstances in Northern Ireland. I wonder, Meg, whether I should also answer the question about Liz Truss and save Gus from having to, he's nodding into his Yeah, head. that would be great. And actually I was gonna say, do, do that, but I was also gonna say, do you actually agree with Anne that the most dangerous, I mean, it's a sort of, it, it makes total sense that the most dangerous situation is when one party is passing on, is passing the baton to an opposing party. But actually, have we reached a point where one faction in the Conservative Party 
is going to be likely to take a scorched earth attitude when about to be replaced by another. So I, I don't think the party transition scenario is necessarily free from danger, but I agree with Anne that the, the more likely and more potentially fundamental dangers are in a post-election scenario, because in the post-election, you know, Boris Johnson's argument, I don't, for what it's worth, I don't agree with him, but his argument against his internal critics of the Conservative Party was the people are still on my side and you've all been forced into a panic by the herd instinct of the media, but the public are still with me. Um, whereas in an election scenario, there's no room for those arguments. The public have spoken. They, they've clearly said this is where we stand. And so uh, I think the damage to democracy is even greater, potentially, if you've got a bad faith actor at that moment in time. But in terms of the current prime minister, I don't think we are in that situation. We're not, we're not in either of the scenarios yet. We're certainly clearly not in a post-election scenario. And we're not yet in a scenario where the Conservative Party has has said that it's lost confidence in her or enough people have come to see her privately that she's come to that conclusion. She is clearly in a very difficult political position. Um, and I think that that but that difficulty stems from two things. One, whenever a whenever a government is forced to U-turn on one of its key policies because its own backbenchers won't support it. Once they've once they've learned the taste for rolling the government over, they, they often develop a taste for that. So there's a there's a problem of authority with her own backbenchers, and then there's a problem of authority with the public. You know, if you look at the latest opinion poll, I think a, a net approval poll in the rating I, in the poll I saw yesterday was worse than Jeremy Corbyn ever got. So that's not a good position for any prime minister to be in. Um, so she's in a very difficult political situation. But I none of the MPs that I speak to at the moment. I think they're all of a view. She's got to be given a bit of time to see if she can recover from this situation. She's clearly got off to a very bad start. Is she able to recover from it? Yes or no? And I'm, I'm sceptical about whether she will be able to. But the, the key point here for our discussion today is that the mood of her colleagues is to give her an opportunity to do that and potentially to form a judgment down the line. So I don't think right now uh, any of the kind of situations that we've been describing on, in this conversation apply, you would just say she's a prime minister in a lot of political trouble right now. There's an interesting kind of analytical question which academics could have a lot of fun with as to whether if you're so constrained by your parliamentary party that you don't step to the left and you don't step to the right, whether it doesn't create something which is rather similar to what we're trying to achieve with a caretaker situation, but not in the same way. Gus, you haven't had a chance at this round yet. <clears throat> just on the on the rogue actors bit, uh, I think that's absolutely true. You know, and I, I did refer to needing politicians to behave well. There is another aspect to this that, that people don't pick up on, which is that during uh, those talks, uh, when you've got a hung parliament, this is one of the important things, there can be some massively important decisions made of a constitutional nature. For example, having a referendum on voting systems, for example, Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which are kind of rushed through incredibly quickly. And as, as we've seen, you know, the Fixed Term Parliaments Act has, has been uh, uh, repealed. Um, not that I'm uh, necessarily against Fixed Term Parliaments and not allowing prime ministers to fire the gun. I think that's a bad thing. But anyway, so I think that's something that we need to think about and pick up on. Um, I, I would just say on Northern Ireland, I mean, uh, there's, there's one thing to add to what Gavin said is, and I'm really pleased you're here, Gavin, because um, <laughs> I didn't want the other question, um, is that God bless the civil servants in Northern Ireland. You know, I mean, it is amazing that, uh, the, that we carried on for so long, but there are serious constraints. And actually the person who you should talk to if you want to go through what it's like to be in that situation is someone you may have heard of recently, um, the audience may have heard of, called Sue Gray, who was in Northern Ireland at the time. And there are really serious issues there where you don't have a government and you are trying to do your best. But what it means is really big decisions that, that matter for the long term just get pushed further and further back. And that cannot be good for the people of Northern Ireland. So it's not a, not a good position we find ourselves in, uh, and I hope it can be resolved. Um, and there's a hint to the Prime Minister to try and sort out something sensible about the Northern Ireland Protocol in there. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much. Lisa, let's have another round. This, this may well be the last round, depending on how many questions. Uh, they're quite meaty questions, so I suspect it may well be. Uh, I'm going to post three anonymous questions uh, to the panel. Uh, so first of all, uh, to what extent are the current arrangements a hangover from the days when parliamentary parties picked their leaders and handovers were quick? Has the change in the party leadership selection systems contributed to this problem? Uh, Secondly, should more be written down as in Australia and New Zealand uh, and talked us through some of the pitfalls of codification? Um, to what extent would further codification help? Um, and finally, um, Robert mentioned in his blog uh, that appointments to the House of Lords Appointments Commission and to CSPL um, were controversial. Um, Gus mentioned um, the dilemmas around war powers and what should be done with those, um, inclusion or otherwise. To what extent should we be thinking about certain categories of powers, perhaps prerogative powers that are more vulnerable uh, to risk of abuse during a caretaker period? And if there are such categories, is there anything that can be done about them? Gus, would you like to go first this time? Uh, gosh, <clears throat> all of those would take uh, quite a long time uh, to get through. The, the first one, <clears throat> parliamentary, what was it again, Lisa? Could you just remind me? Uh, this was about the change in um, leadership mm. selection. Yes, um, I think obviously that is a matter for the political parties, but yes, it would be a lot easier. I mean, I was uh, working with John Major during the leadership election um, when the Conservatives decided that they wanted a change. That was rap fairly rapid and fairly smooth. And um, I think that gives a good example. <clears throat> I think there the, the really is a, a question here also about um, when you make changes. Uh, I always say to people, think about this in the long term. You know, do you, you know it may, may make sense to do it now, but do you think it will be sensible always? And because it's very hard to turn back. So yeah, I think, I hope they'll do something about that. In terms of writing more down, I think um, Meg got this right, that this, this is the whole question about, you know, to what extent do we want a written constitution? Uh, as soon as you write things down in a world that's rapidly changing, you're not sure that they're appropriate for the longer term. You know, this is why I've often said, you know, legislation as an answer to problems is often a bit clunky, uh, particularly in, a, you know, dynamic areas like digital it can be really difficult and you end up legislating for something that's just wildly inappropriate five years on because of technical changes so you did, i think suggest in your opening remarks that we might want to put something in legislation related to this yes. area I don't know if you had something in mind the, um <clears throat> i think that, i mean it would come down to picking up what gavin said about certain sorts of uh you know different circumstances I think something which which differentiated these two the, the different ways in which this convention might apply, and then some of the rules around them. There's 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 a chance that there are some areas that we could have in legislation. Now I'm, I'm I've got an open mind at the minute. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to uh, back any particular things, but um, I, I it just there are you know a bit about appointments. I guess I think I would try and rule that out if I have one thing that I would legislate for mm. but again it's you know it's a limited thing and um it, it wouldn't it wouldn't cover prerogative powers to to say that I think that's uh I think the law sorted that one out actually quite successfully so I wouldn't want to do more on that front and there is a review that we've been promised a new cabinet manual, haven't we? That it's been looked at by Parliament. Mm -hmm. So this is an open issue, which um, I think we're showing up that some of the importance of doing that review. Yeah. And, um, do you have sort of particular bits of advice? I mean, I don't know whether you have the kind of categories that were, were that were proposed in the third question. Whether if we do expand what's written down, whether there are some things it would be sensible to include, and other things that maybe we should be wary of including. Yeah, the guidelines well, as that have developed that have sorry that was that to me, Meg. I might have yeah, missed yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so those guidances have evolved around new and emergent issues. So you know, um, ministerial websites became a big who should be posting things to the departmental. So the technological things have been expanded uh, in a lot of detail. Um, 
you know, lot other things. The appointments one is something that I think will be grappled with because it was just so untrammeled, just so <laughs> unleashed in that period. And, and Labor's really grappling with how to, un uh, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is one that's just been completely stacked uh, and they're grappling with how to uh, to deal with that at the moment. I'll just quickly, uh, before I let Gavin have a, a, a minute, um, you know, what are some of the benefits of codification? Well, you know, a good one of them is the institutional memory, actually, with people turning over and with the socialising of, of people to arrangements and, you know, how we actually want these traditions to work. So there are real benefits in that so that people, you know, can understand them can um, you know they are some I mean the, the sort of prime minister and cabinet runs a bit of a hotline uh, where they provide advice and a bit of a war room to agency heads to give them advice help so uh, you know uh, many of us had forgotten the the uh, example that um, Gus mentioned you know I can think of troops being committed to Iraq in 2004 where John Howard said I and it was during the caretaker period I don't have to consult with the opposition on that there's nothing that you know says that I do I'm still the government so you know but but our memory of the examples kind of um you know is lost so they can be really useful for that point of view and I think elaborating it with examples can help people to think it through whether you include that in the formal guidance or whether that becomes some part of the briefing and support that you provide people in the lead up to these um, scenarios uh, I think is worth considering um, but as you know as, as Gus and Gavin have both said Politicians hate to have their discretion um, crimped in any way, shape or form. And in the end, it's impossible to get around that principle of, um, of parliamentary sovereignty as, as, it, as it should be. Uh, so how do we encourage better behaviour? And I think you guys have been doing some really good work uh, on that in trying to um, you know, give attention to those kind of questions. Thank you. And then Gavin, you have the final word. Um, so I think mean, the first question is the easiest one to answer, which is the, the change in party electoral systems definitely hasn't helped because it, it means in those scenarios, you've got a much longer time scale that you're dealing with the issue than you would have had historically. And I, I very much hope that we'll see change there, um, particularly when parties are in government. I think when a party's in opposition, you can mount a much stronger case for involving a much broader range of people in the decision and take your time over it. It's much more, you know, uh, much more of a debate often about strategy there because nearly always when you've a change leader there you've just lost an election and you're trying to work out well where do we go from here um, but I don't think it serves the country well to have the kind of three-month hiatus that we had over the summer even in normal times and we weren't even we weren't in normal times in this situation um, I think in terms of the the other two questions uh, that were posed I, I'd probably be skeptical about kind of full codification but I think Gus's example of reviewing what's there at the moment maybe separating out these two different types of situation that we've talked about in this conversation um, and having those documents very clearly in the public domain. I think often the best, it's very difficult to legislate for all the different complexities of situation. We haven't talked about the Blair Brown transition right today, but on the face of it, that was a voluntary resignation, but you know, there were politics behind that, right? So it's very difficult to codify, I think, for every exact situation. But I think what works best is you have some clear principles that are in the public domain and then the scrutiny of the media and, and other politicians um, is the best way, I guess, of defending against um, bad faith uh, actors. And then the final thing that I wanted to say was on appointments, where um, my solution here, I think, would not just be about what happens in these kind of caretaker or lame duck situations. I feel very strongly that this country has a huge job to do to regain credibility in our institutions. I think significant damage has been done over the last few years. You know, if you think about the immediate events of the last couple of weeks, not publishing an OBR report, sacking a highly distinguished Treasury civil servant right before you made these decisions. Um, and so, uh, and also questions, maybe unfairly, but questions about the independence of the bank, because things have been said in the leadership election about kind of changing the mandate. And so I really think we need to look at the extent to which the people on the MPC, head of the OBR, and maybe even some of the most senior civil service positions, whether there is some role for parliament alongside government there so that we can regain the confidence of markets and of you know the international community more generally in the strength of our institutions, which used to be one of one of this country's real kind of crown jewels essentially. We've allowed that to erode 
And I hope it's not easy to do right now, but I hope as we move on, we can have a kind of cross party debate about how we correct that. No, I mean, I'm, I'm not a politician anymore, but I used to be one. And I entirely understand politicians don't like things that slow them up, but sometimes there's a case for it. Um, you know, and one of the things I would say to my former colleagues is if you look at the moment at the cost this country pays to borrow money, it's nearly twice that which Germany pays. And we need to be thinking about things we can do that repair that situation because they have the, they have these real world effects that I think sometimes when you have these debates about appointments and all the sort of intricacies of how our constitution works, it feels abstract. But confidence in institutions has real world effects that we're we're paying a price for. I'm afraid at the moment. That's a really we endorse all of that. <laughs> Very, Very timely and interesting point on which to end, and maybe it gives me uh, it gives us an agenda for maybe a future event, but also an opportunity to plug the piece that I had on the Constitution Unit blog yesterday, uh, which was about the fundamentally constitutional roots of the economic crisis, saying some of those things that if you start to shut out um, independent civil servants and experts and um, regulatory bodies, you can end up flat on your face in terms of policy, and it can have quite significant real world as well as political effects. Um, so it just remains to me to thank our fantastic panel. I think you've really done, you've done enormous amount to, um, I think, enlighten anybody who's been listening to this as to the importance and the, the great kind of interest and complexity of this topic. And I hope that people are gonna go away and think, we've got to really think about this now. So you've, you've kicked off, uh, I, th I think, what's well, a really important discussion. You've all been great with your different insights from different perspectives. I would like to thank also the audience for coming, particularly for those who submitted questions. And I'm sorry if you submitted a question that we didn't have time to get to. Um, I said at the beginning that this was being recorded and it will be on our website, our YouTube channel, and it will be a Constitution Unit podcast shortly. Um, those of you who signed up for the event will be getting an email to let you know when it's available. And if you've enjoyed the event, then please do recommend it and pass it on to your friends and family and colleagues uh, to have a listen. Um, finally, if you're not already signed up to the Constitution Unit's mailing list to hear about our events, then I would encourage you to do so. We've got three more events planned for this autumn. Uh, the next one is going to be on the monarchy um, and uh, you know, lots of new stuff to talk about there. Uh, we're planning an event on the trust government and the constitution and a final one on public attitudes to the constitution and democracy in the UK. Um, they'll all be on our website soon, uh, but if you'd like to receive a message alerting you to them when they, um, when they are um, put up, do please go to our website, select get involved and then click subscribe in order to join our events mailing list and you'll be the first to know. So that's it from me. Thank you all again, um, and until our next event, um, goodbye.